Hello and welcome everyone to the OpenZFS production users call. We have Michael Antronix too. Uh, it's not group, it's Greg. What, what typo did I did? Greg, Jan, Santi, Alexander, and Andy. Uh, this is November the 6th. We have multiple topics at hand. And uh, thank you for everyone who participated in the uh, summit last week. Or was it was it last week? It was last week. And thank you, Dexter, for organizing. Uh yeah, the floor. My pleasure. Is Jan here? I hope Jan is here. Yes, I was just muted. Oh no worries. I see a ZFS program. I'm going to zoom in a bit yep. because it's code. There we go. This is from a shell script. Uh, we have a just IO redirection so that I have my Lua code available as a here doc on standard input. And I use ZFS program dash N to get a read only execution. So that I don't have the overhead of a, um, being part of a write transaction. So um, that's the flag, and now we can't see the code because uh, you. <laughs> I'm I know, I know, I know. I'm just opening the man page. Don't worry. Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, the first argument after the flag is just the pool name. The parent variable contains the uh, uh, ZFS data set, with, which is the parent of all the jails. So I strip everything uh, after the first slash to get just the pool. I use uh, slash def std in, which is a sim link to slash def fd zero, which is basically how I can tell the command to reopen the file descriptor. Uh, from a path so that I don't have to have a special flag to read from standard in, uh, because as far as I know, we don't have that. But at least on FreeBSD and Linux, you can have uh, slash dev fd to open your open uh, files again, um, which solves that problem. So then we have um, the remaining nah, arguments as such, just a list of shell variables I want to pass into the script. When you invoke ZFS channel programs from the command line, your arguments are always an array of strings because it is basically a shell interface at that point. And uh, shell is always just arrays of strings. Uh, if you call it from C through libzfs or libzfs core, you can provide an arbitrary NV list uh, as long as all the types are supported and have a mapping to Lua types. And so I have to um, treat the function as a var arc function, so that the arcs e equals three dots, which basically is how you um, pick up your variadic argument list uh, in Lua. So now I have a table of the um, <laughs> array of strings. OK. Uh, then that table contains the argument list in the subtable arcv. That's just how the parameters are passed uh, by the ZFS program when you invoke it through the shell. So uh, I just extract them into a table with named fields. That's a boilerplate at the beginning. Then I have a function called match snapshots, which gets the name of a data set and the name of the snapshot I'm searching. And because I can't trust it to be a single recursive snapshot, I use this channel program to walk down uh, all the child data sets recursively. And for each child data set, I check if it has a snapshot of the name I want to find. If so, I collect it up in the snapshots table, which is a local variable, and that gets returned. So that. Basically, gives me yep, 
um, array of all the snapshots with a specific name after the ad, even if they're not recursively created. And then when Netch clones one, it shows the part I'm still working on how to do it correctly. The idea here is that I want to find uh, the clones which are not uh, derived from the corresponding data set with the, in the other name, same relative name, same snapshot. And if that is not my origin, I want it listed, including if it doesn't have an origin. So this is basically going to tell me if I have any uh, clones with the wrong origin or if I have any extra clones which no longer exist. So, um, which also implies that they have the wrong origin, but still. And the other thing, this is basically then the list of things. The first one gives me a list of things I have to have in my clone set. So if, that, if there's something in there, which is supposed to be an origin, but I don't have a clone of that, then I have to take uh, a clone. And in the opposite direction, if I have a clone of something, which is not the right origin, um, I have to destroy it, or if it doesn't even exist as a clone, I probably shouldn't destroy it and just error out if I have a data set which conflicts with the name which should be a clone, because destroying a um, non-clone file system is, is probably a bit too aggressive for an automation anyone feels comfortable running. Yeah. And so that's what I'm tinkering with so that I can quickly get that out of the kernel and then fix up the jail to look like I want it to look. So uh, this is a demo of Jan, also known as the uh, human Lua parser. Uh, it's not as fast as large language, language models, but you can use it during meetings and calls. As you can see, it did zero errors. And it explained the code very clearly. So, um, I also have to make sure that just for safety purposes that I don't enter the recursion if the root of the recursion doesn't exist, but yeah. Mm, and then I can't return multiple values directly from a general program. Trying to return more than one value from a general program uh, gives you a fatal error, uh, which means that you're GFS program has failed. And um, yeah, but I can return a table. So you just have to collect your, in this case, two return values uh, into a single table, and then you can return it as one value. It's a bit annoying that you don't have a nice way to get the output out in an easy to um, Pass format for um, further processing by the shell. You have to pick to either, um, yeah, understand the indentation in the pretty printed output, or um, you have to pass the JSON output, which is fine for saner languages and shell, but not for shell scripting. And I was wondering if any one of you had any recommendations here on how to do the second part uh, cleanly and splitting it up. Because I want to do as little uh, string uh, processing inside the channel program as possible. Not everyone at once. The 
instead of my bow legs. Okay, in that case, I will just uh, finish with explaining the purpose of it at a higher level. The purpose is I have a jail derived from clones. I make sure that the clones are kept read only so that I don't trap myself with modifications inside the clones, which then allows me to um, just remove the clones and create new ones when I want to update an instance of a templated. Uh, thin J. And yeah, I want to keep it so fast the verification that everything is in sync that I can keep it in the jail uh, startup path so that every time the jail is started, it checks if it's in sync with what is specified. And if I change the specification to a new snapshot, um, it will just on the next start of the jail remove what is out of what is stale and then clone what is missing. Sorry, I'm getting people messaging me. Where are we? We're at the point where I uh, confused everyone. It, it's, it's been a, it's been quite a day. Um, the, so I, um, I'm betraying my ignorance here a little bit, but, uh, what what is it cloning at, at the end after it uh, after it picks up the the snapshot it's supposed to and, and then deploys uh, off of that one? This channel program because there is no API to create clones only to create snapshots inside the channel programs the clones do not get created I'm only collecting them and then I have to invoke ZFS clone several times once per uh, discovered uh, misconfiguration. This is only gathering the basically the delta between what should be uh, there and what I've discovered is there so that I don't have to go through lots of ZFS list uh, or get calls so that I can use a channel program to return the filtered results directly from the kernel instead of having to walk it every time and basically do a ZFS list on the of the names and then check for each name if there's a snapshot and of that name and so on. Oh, ah, okay. And because cool. I have quite frequent uh, automated um, snapshot creations for replication and backup purposes, I don't want to just recursively list all file systems and snapshots in the jails uh, data set and then filter it out in user space either. So it's really nice that you can do basically a in-kernel filter and recursively walk the data sets uh, in the Lua program. But yeah, it would be nice if there was a flag to have a scripting friendly undecorated output from ZPool program, but I guess that wasn't a, a common enough use case that anyone bothered to implement a dash H as an uppercase H uh, for ZFS program. Hmm. Cool. Cool, cool. Thank you. Um, 
All right. Well, uh, if nobody has any any fun notes on this uh, beyond, I think you should rewrite it in Rust. Um, then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had a ZFS in Rust talk. Uh, oh no no no! Developer no, 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 no yeah no! Don't do this. No, no, I was kidding. Please. You know, I, I, as in, it's not even that far fetched. That people, <laughs> even Rust developers have found that ZFS is a solid base to build upon, and they want to use a user space ZFS uh, to uh, use it as oh, their yeah. redundant storage engine to build upon in Rust. Yeah, no, so why not? And, so, like the infrastructure they put in place with an async runtime to attempt to keep uh, context switching costs down to less than full kernel thread context switching costs of, uh, yeah, so that you could basically have stackless user space uh, multitasking. Uh, at least for Rust parts there, that was an interesting mindfuck at least. <laughs> Uh, let's see. So we had this. Uh, do we want to do which? Which? Which was the next uh, item on the uh, carefully constructed agenda? I have a stupid question like this. Uh, union that, that, seems like, um, that seems like it might be. It might like open up. I, okay, so tell me to shut up if I'm being stupid. But um, that seems like a discussion that could branch off a lot of like really cool discussions. Do we want to do that one last? So that way, if people want to hang on and be like, oh, well, you could do this or you could do that or you know, this other stuff. Greg seems like a something uh, you know more uh, less less prone to that. I don't know. That's that's my beat on it. As the author of the question, I'm I'm changing yes, the. Uh, I'm 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 doing a soft power coup, uh, <laughs> <laughs> forcing your. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. Good. I I've I've been I've been sated. Um. So, uh, Greg, why don't why don't you uh, open up on? Uh, I know you mentioned it earlier, but uh, why don't you describe the the use case here a bit? Just for the recording, I guess. Hey, Greg, if you're there, we can't hear you. This is this is because I asked to mess with the order that we had them and see if it, that wasn't the case. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, yeah, moving right along, I suppose. We'll do that one last. Ground control to Greg. Why not? Oh, that was good. That was right on. Perfect uh, uh, rhythm right there. Um, Yep. Okay, fine. Let's open the demon's uh, chest, I guess. Um, uh, here's why I have this question, which is uh, in Illumos, there is this cool thing called brands for uh, zones. And one of the brands, I wonder if I can find the brands in here. No, I can't find them in here. One of the brands is LIPKG. Uh, I think it's linked IPKG technically, right? Uh, Omni OS LIPKG. Yeah, that's. And it it somehow like mounts this the post to the to 
Who the zone? I've forgotten. Or am I dumb? No, you're not. Is um, that a union or is that some I'm kind not of sure. special sibling? Or is it a, more like a null FS or Linux bind mount? Um, I'm not sure how it does it now that now that you're bringing us up. <laughs> um, I think all it would of my, have to be of... some kind of union because it is possible to install packages within just yes. just the one yep. zone, even yep. though it uses the parent zone stuff. Yeah, but yeah, is that implemented as a union? on the file system level or is it visible basically like a new like you have things in slash usr and slash usr local on freebsd and you would have just one more directory to scan through things and the linker path just ties it all together and this command search path does anyone know how it's implemented isn't it supposed to be here? Oh yeah, there we go, brands. Okay, where are all the brands? Oh, there are no brands in the Illumost because the brands are implemented by the distribution. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot more sense for why I couldn't find it in here. Okay, so that's why we have it in the OmniOS manuals. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I know what... there's stuff in both the OmniOS and the Open Indiana related to it. Um, on the production, I also see the same thing. Let's let me do mount on my post and see what I see. I have a zone named dub, dub, dub zero, and I would get the following. Yeah, it's called oh link, link image zone. Yes. I'm going to paste this here. I uh, hope that there is no confidential information, but you never know. Although, to be fair, this is a community server. Um, let's see. So I think I should do like this. Then I should do like that. And then I should select. Oh, they changed after R22 how they work. So let's Let's do it that way. Okay, so here's what I see on my system. Uh, this is my pool. This is the zone, I guess. Then there is dev. That's, okay, that's a devfs. Then there's a libfs, or like, li I don't know what this means. And then there's sbin and this, and then services for some reason. Oh yeah, because, that's how you manage the services of the zone from the host, or the, rather the global zone, I should say. ProcFS, contracts, MNT tab, objects, violate, share tab. I have no idea what all of these are, by the way. LibC, for some reason, is mounted. FD. Uh, LibC is always mounted on Solaris. LibC is always but... mounted on Solaris. That's... Yeah. Uh, is that how you keep your um, ABI stable? By having someone inject the libc and then the system call interface is intentionally unstable? I'm not sure the specifics of, of, of why it is. I just know that that is, norm, that, that is normal even if you're on a global zone, you'll see that. There we go. That's the one. L-I-P-K-G. Okay. So what do you do? And by the way, there's a new version. I totally forgot to say. Um, I should start running again my Illumos News website. Um, 50? No, wait. 52. Wait a second. 52... When was 52 released? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, two days ago. Yeah. Yeah, 52. Yeah, it got released two days ago. I totally forgot about that. Yes. Mm, must be match or super set of global. 
So it's the same as before. Updating the child zone package when updating the global zone. Unless package is marked as parent dependent on yeah, the system. Okay. The middle one is the only one that has different behaviors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, that explains a lot for when I install, like, let's say, iperf on the host, sorry, on the global zone, it automatically gets installed everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean every uh, linked image zone. But how do they do, get the linked image zone? Like, what what's, like, out of these mount things, how is it done? Is it like a bindfs style mount, like nullfs, where, like, these are... You know, what do you call that? Mounted? Would that make sense? I don't know. What's this? Oh, those are now the normal things. Okay. And then there's opt downloads. Oh, that's also, I, I created that. Sorry, I created that. Yeah. This is, this is for my mirror, which is at omniOS.ilomos.am. It's still running. That that's good to know. Okay, I should update or rather add the fifty two here at this point. Yeah, but like I said, uh I saw this, but I have no idea how it works. I don't I don't know how they merge together either. Mm -hmm. I mean I should ask Andy. I mean the other Andy. Yeah, I know. I know who you mean. Um Yeah, because that's definitely an interesting question. Andy, if you're listening, please write a write-up. Thank you. Yeah, that, that would be something very fun to know. What's DFS, may I ask? E ETC D DFS? Distributed file system? No, I don't think so. I should know that. DFS. D God damn it. Man the DFS. Man DFS tab. Is that SMB distributed file system mode? Oh, yeah, you're right. A file containing commands for sharing resources across a network. Yeah, each line of the DFS file consists of share command. The DFS file can be read by the shell to share all resources. This is a very typical of, you know, the network is the computer type of design. And I love it. Can't complain. This is this is amazing. Okay. Well, I'm just going to keep this here. And if anyone has any ideas, it would be good to know. Uh, these are the file systems which are available on Illumos. Wait, I lost them again. There we go. So it has to be done by one of these, as far as I can tell. DCFS, compression file system. You guys have so many interesting things that probably other people have no idea it even exists, like as a concept. The contract one was new for me. Where is that? CTFS, contract file system. C contract. Everything here is so... Well documented that I need a large language model to explain things to me at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, Jan sent us a link, but it takes us to the, um, how do I say that? The Nazi website, but it's okay. I'm going to click on it. There we go. The evil side. The evil side, yes. E Corp. O Corp. Uh, contract access is friends. Uh, yeah. the amount of the amount of conditional. I have no idea what that means. Large file. I mean, maybe it means like two megabytes in size. Oh, two gigabytes in size. Okay. We're talking like 16 bit days. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay, I I don't have any more questions about this. I guess I uh, will should like sit down and read uh, until Greg comes back, uh, which he will apparently. Uh, Jan has a comment which is a D trace one liner that ZFS debug message trace string of org zero, and I love that very much. Uh, Jan, what does this print? May I ask? Uh, it captures any time the kernel function for ZFS or well the static trace point for the ZFS debug message is hit. Mm -hmm. So anytime uh, either a channel program called ZFS dot debug yep. or um, any other action is run and it has a hook to do some recording through a debug message, uh, you get that and can read along what happens to your system. For example, you will get a one for bookmarks for snapshots for holds mm. and releases and then you get a line like a command um, mm -hmm. telling you which zfs command gets executed yeah. from inside the kernel yeah. it knows that okay for example zfs bookmark some data set uh, at hash and so on is set or um, some i to destroy a bookmark was in the just looking at what's happening on my system while Z REPL is running, for mm. example. And on, um, yeah. uh, and on inferior Unix like systems, sorry, I mean on Linux, since they don't have DTrace, does this um, probe also work with uh, BPF trace? No fucking idea. <laughs> um, maybe they have it as a file in the SysFS or PROCFS. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I didn't look if there's an equivalent. Um, Gentlemen, I didn't have I a use you for it. In, that uh, we are being recorded. <laughs> but uh, I haven't looked. Not that you it's can not probably our find an equivalent point to watch with uh, BPF trays, but I didn't have the need while looking at my uh, channel program to. Uh, Debug it under Linux, so I have no idea. It's just <laughs> unfiltered reality. <laughs> oh God! Oh God! This was this was way too much for today. Oh my God! Oh my God! Uh, I'm gonna say, where is that? Two hundred fifty-six at this point. <laughs> the DFS, the DFS, uh, Etsy DFS has the DFS tab file, which traditionally was used for managing, um, like NF NFS and SMB type shares. Yeah, I think that um, like predates Auto Mount D. Uh, it, it predates ZFS because it's been mostly superseded according yeah. to the documentation I see here. HSFS. Okay. This is nice. No, I mean, your documentation is easily one of the best Unix documentations I've ever seen in my life. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm admittedly I, I, I'm looking at the evil red empire, so. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, yeah. I think I missed something. Why Why did you fail to open the page? Oh, because I did the link long, uh, wrong. Okay. Okay, good to know. Um, okay, good to know. Uh, Greg, are you... <laughs> Greg, are you back? I, I am. Yeah, I think you're Welcome back. Yeah, sorry, my boss is talking to me. No worries. Uh, was or is? I hate it when that happens. Was. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, it says, how to safely remove a metadata device from a pool. Uh, team, you can chime in. Yeah, uh, Jan already uh, shot me the man page. I, di I didn't realize there's a, a command method to do that, so. Ooh. Yeah, 
I am. I think it's for the, uh, Greg, if, uh, if, if you could, just for the, the sick YouTube ad rev, uh, could you take <laughs> the case? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, uh, but first make sure to hit like and subscribe. Um, and then, <laughs> then <laughs> uh, so, so I have a, uh, a machine that's in production. So it was set up for uh, production use, um, has NVMe flash in it. Uh, and we use that for the L2 ARC, uh, the cache and the uh, special device which holds small files and metadata. So now I want to yank out that card to repurpose it, but I need to flush all the uh, metadata and small file to the uh, standard spin and disk pool. And I just want to know if there was a method or procedure to do that. And uh, Jan oh, pointed me to a page. Arc? is just a cache. Yeah, so that can go away, you, yeah. That you can just remove and that effectively invalidates the cache. Yes, the A2 arc is a victim cache that doesn't contain anything dirty uh, normally, so uh, it's not hard to just remove it and be done with it, and your pool keeps on ticking along just fine. Um, the problems start with the special location class because that's real file system metadata and if you allow it to store small data blocks also file system data that you can't just rip out and expect to have a readable pool left especially when you want to store all your allocation metadata on there uh, for performance reasons instead the here is now that um, you have to treat that like normal device removal and effectively set up a kind of volume inside the pool, which is then marked as don't allocate from the device we're removing. Then you copy everything in there. And over time, hopefully, that indirection uh, slowly goes away because new writes don't go through that indirection once the device is removed. And so basically, as the last references to a block are removed, um, you get rid of that indirection over time. I don't think you will realistically ever get rid of the marker as uh, on the pool as having used device removal, but I don't think there's an old enough uh, OpenZFS version you have to worry about, which does not understand device removal. Yeah. Now, th this th this will be a good test because it's not imperative that that this works. Um, the The intention is that I don't have to copy all this data over the network to it again when I rebuild the pool. So I'm just trying to figure out a way if I can use the data that's on there and it becomes its own second yeah. copy. Yeah. Oh, uh, if you mentioned that there's triple mirroring. In that case, you may even be able to use something fast ranger, which is ZFS split. So instead of um, just removing devices, you can, if you have enough redundancy in your pool, basically uh, bisect your pool into two new pools, which start out identical. One is renumbered, you have the new UUID and so on, and then now you have two pools. Uh, if you have triple mirrors, you can have one double mirrored and one without redundancy. I'm oh, sorry, um, what's, uh, sorry, when you're done, what the hell is Z-pool split? That's the command to do what I just said, to take one uh, redundant ZFS pool yeah. and cut it into two identical pools by, uh, by the having two pools with reduced redundancy. Huh. So if you have triple mirrors, you can, for example, split off a, a st purely striped pool mm -hmm. and go from triple to double mirrored. Oh, that's fascinating. Which is faster than going over the network if you can just uh, use yeah, it means you some can, kind of sun. It means you can or pull... Even the disks and 
you know, take them in your Volkswagen to the other facility because that's usually faster than going over the network, depending on your size yeah. of data. Yeah, so like it opens up new possibilities. Now I can actually what? convince customers to have mm -hmm. mirrors everywhere instead of RAID Zs everywhere. Uh, one way you can use this is also to just to later split it off again. Let's say you have a normal two-way mirror pool. You yeah. uh, hook up a J-Bot to the system. You yeah. add mm -hmm. two new disks to every mirror. So you have a wasteful four-way mirror. And as they are added and are resolved, you can later then split off the normal two-way uh, mirror. Mm -hmm by removing the newly added disks from the pool. The pool is just fine because uh, on a mirrored pool, there is no cost with removing mirrors because you're not removing VDEVs, you're only yes. detaching drives from the mirrors, which means the on-disk allocation doesn't have to change because each mirror has basically identical, near identical bits on it. Uh, so yeah. So to be that's a way to. Uh, our, if you have a link. big pool and you want to perfectly mirror it, you can actually do it. You just add a JBot to your system. You add new disks to your existing VDEVs. Don't add new VDEVs, but attach the new disks to existing mirrors, and then you can later split off a new pool from the mirrors you just added. So it's to have it in a niche mind, use case, but it's about the fastest way yeah. you can create a new pool. So to have it in my mind, our limitations is we can't remove VDEVs unless it's log or cache, and we can't shrink a VDEV. A mirror can also be removed. Oh, yeah. Or single so disk. So RAID Z is the only one that has a limitation, that you can't shrink a RAID Z. Um, you can't, exactly, you cannot remove this from a RAID Z, and you can't remove the RAID Z uh, VDEV. You can't remove the RAID Z VDEV, okay. And uh, the same applies to DRAID, as far as I know. Yeah. So parity rate cannot be uh, removed. Shrunk or removed? Okay, got it. Because it has a more complicated on the layout. Yeah, yeah, that's good to know because usually what customers say is, "I would love to have a RAID Z2 or a RAID Z3 uh, with ten disks." Right, that's their usual response. Totally because, valid. I know because they don't because they're okay with like sacrificing write a speed for more disk space, right? But I would prefer um, if I had a rate 10. Yes and no. The, the thing is with mirroring is that after a certain size, you have to go with three-way or higher mirroring because mm -hmm. you cannot afford to lose a single mirror. And if you have only two disk mirrors, you're just two disk failure as a way from total pool failure. I see what you mean. Uh, so if you have a 100 or 200 disk pool and you have 200 Because my disks, next system is gonna be, my next so system that you have, And if you turn those 200 disks into 100 two-way mm -hmm. mirrors, mm -hmm. just one of these pairs has to fail simultaneously. And mm -hmm. the other annoying part is which is often overlooked if you just do the one-time calculation is that you do, don't have any uh, redundancy while resilvering. So basically now to ever repair that pool, ignoring copies larger than yeah. one, uh, yeah. you have to be able to perfectly read every block on the remaining disk in the mirror if it's degraded. So if you lose a mirrored disk, now you have to read every single allocated block on the remaining mirror members. And if it's a two-way mirror, that means this one remaining disk must not have a single unrecoverable read error 
while reading all allocated data from it. So if I'm building a system with 45 disks, mm -hmm. I could go with, uh, I could go with, let's see, um, 10 disks VDEV with RAID Z1. At least five spare disks. That's and a bit excessive. Is, and, yeah, and five spare disks, right? So yeah, you that's... would probably go more along the way of eleven and one cold spare of a oh. whole pool, so oh. that you have four eleven wide. But yeah, then the issue is, mm, it's not a power of two among the non parity disks. So basically, maybe you want something like eight data disks and two parity disks for ten, because that has the advantage of. If you have a full stripe, that's a power of two. So you can take your A shift, most likely four kilobytes, multiply that by a power of two, and then you have a new minimum optimal block size, which, because otherwise you end up with a problem that you have your blocks uh, rotating around in a suboptimal fashion. It still works, but you're losing a bit of efficiency there. And the other problem with mirroring is mirroring is great for reading, but for writing, you don't get anything from the mirrors. It's not much overhead to write to both mirrors, but if you have parity uh, and you have wide enough parity, let's say you have a, I don't know, let's say you have yeah, your 10 disk grade Z2 uh, uh, VDEV, that gives you eight data disks, so you uh, just write eight fragments or yeah, smaller blocks um, and two parity bits, which means you get basically the stripe bandwidth minus the bandwidth of uh, parity disks. So basically, yeah, for really big blocks sequentially written or medium blocks written to flash, uh, you do get performance benefits from RAID Z while writing if you have a fast enough CPU. And mm. Greg wrote something. Yeah, Jan, Jan, if I do the triple mirroring that you were talking about, how would I do that with 45 disks? The, that's up to you. You could say, okay, round down to the, oh, wait, triple mirroring is already equally dividable by 45. Yes. So you could just say, pick. Now times. you come to the point, you just take mirrors and instead of giving mirror and then two names of devices during pool creation, you give you start Z pool create mirror and then three names or even four if you really wanted to, not that it would make much sense rationally. And if I do, wait, if I do, let's say, let's so say. So you could uh, say 15. Uh, freeware mirrors, for example, if, if so and I that would give you a uh, really uh, good read IOPS, for example. If I have each disk at 20 TBs, the mm -hmm. raw would be uh, 45 times 20 TB equals... I mean, Google, you could have auto-completed this instead of people's names. You useless piece of... So apologies, I'm, I'm just getting a bit angry here. Uh, 900, right? 900 uh, TBs. But if I have it at... Uh... Sure, guys. Uh, mm -hmm. See you next week or tomorrow at the VIP. Uh, and if I have... if I have, That's with 45 disks. And if I have with a 15, 15 times three-way mirror, I would mm -hmm. get... You have 15... I would get yeah. 900 divided by 15. 300 terabytes, just you lost yeah, so two thirds of your raw bits. Uh, by, by three, sorry, yes. Okay. Which okay. is why it... But I would have times 15 read speed? No. No, I would have times, times three. three read speed. And what about... In an optimal speed? case. In optimal, and, and but the write speed, it would be... Unimproved at best, potentially a little bit of overhead compared to just having a YOLO 
strike pool with no redundancy because you have to have the just IO bandwidth to uh, write to multiple disks. And as far as I know, no, it's not 0.7, it's more like 0.9 something uh, on a reasonably design system. How can I make the write speed faster? <laughs> yeah, the question is what is your write speed limitation? Is it okay. really the, so let's take a random example. You uh, have been screwed over by your um, MSP and they gave you a server with two and a half inch disks. Turns out those are spinning laptop disks from the mm -hmm. last decade. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're horribly slow and they have no IOPS to speak of mm -hmm. and barely any read or write bandwidth. And life is horrible. Yes. Okay, if you have such a system and you're limited to doing the uh, best you can with it instead of going to the source of a problem, um, now what can you do? You're probably really limited at that point by the disks. So you're, everything else is faster than an old spinning laptop drive. Um, so you have to get more spindles you can write to at the same time. Parity rate is a way to do that because you're effectively going to stripe your data over the non-parity disks, theoretically. In ZFS, there is not a static partitioning like with weight three or something, where oh, you yeah, have a dedicated parity so, disk. So, but so are, you say, are you saying that four times 10 rate Z2s could be faster than 15 times three-way mirrors? So the thing is, how many data spinnets do you have to write to if you're truly only limited by disk speed? How many data what? How many spinnets or spinning disk or whatever? Because mm -hmm. with SSDs, you were probably hitting some other bottleneck first at that point, mm -hmm. unless you have a very generous server to go with it. Mm -hmm. If you have 45 uh, four lane uh, PCI Gen 4 on your SSDs, you're probably running out of just PCIe bandwidth before mm -hmm. you're running out of flash write speed. Yeah, yeah. So at that point, what Greg said about, damn, isn't there any way to uh, broadcast or multicast data, as far as I know, it's there is no such thing in Solitude SCSI, uh, because yeah, it's a point-to-point -point interface, and it's not a multicast-capable network interface or something. Um, so if you take your 15 uh, freeway mirrors, you have effectively 15 disks you can write to, because mm -hmm. every time you write to a mirror, you have to write to all three disks in the mirror, and there you don't get any performance benefits. You only mm -hmm. get the performance benefit from mirroring when it comes to reading the data back, because thanks to end-to-end -to -end checksumming, ZFS doesn't have even to verify read more than one copy uh, of the data. So unlike some other paranoid enterprise search products which read all copies of the data because mm -hmm. and then compare the copies because they don't have checksums. ZFS has strong checksums, so it only has to read one copy to do a very integrity verifying read, which is what ZFS always does. Mm -hmm. Which means that at read time, yes, you get the read IOPS almost of all 15 times three, so 45 disks. But if you have your read a uh, Z2 and yeah, or you read Z2 and you have your 11 white stripes, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, now you have your, yeah, you can't really have um, your nine, um, oh, sorry, your nine white data. So yeah, it's effectively eight, but hey. So you have uh, over, let's take the example of outrounding problems with four 10 write rate Z2s. 
So this now gives you a 10 right rate Z2, and each of them has effectively a peak throughput of the eight non parity disks in the 10 disk rate Z2. Uh, if you're not bottleneck computing the parity, which you shouldn't, uh, at least for spinning disks on a modern CPU, assuming you have something like an archival use or something, then rate Z is a really good trade off. We just lost the screen share, I think. Anyone there? Yeah, you're not alone. Yeah, I'm here. Something happened, though. Sorry, it's just my, my battery was dying, so the Zoom decided to stop the screen share. Okay. Uh, do you have power so we're not losing the recording? No, no, no not at all, luckily. Okay. Um, continue where I think I left off, at least. So the advantage with rate C2 is that you're able to use more effective write bandwidth. The downside is that rate Z2 or rate Z3, any kind of parity rate, does not give you more blocks per second, just wider, larger blocks. So you will quickly, on at least spinning disks, find that you're not limited by theoretical peak throughput, but by real world IOPS per second, which is why the optimization Greg did is so um, useful to have a hybrid pool with the metadata and uh, directory nodes and so on, mostly allocated to a fast flash. And then to keep the cost down, um, the bulk data on spinning disk. Hmm. So that you can if you understand your workload correctly, keep a cost almost to those of spinning disks, but get vastly improved average access times. And one of the things that came up um, out in Portland was uh, one of the people had a workload of, of basically uh, video files and whatnot. So if he has a huge video file and then little bits of metadata, like, like metadata files, those metadata files, putting them on one of those special devices can cause you not to chew a whole stripe for those little files. But Whereas the um, video file is going to largely be whole stripes anyway. How large hmm. are those small files? Are they tens to hundreds of bytes or thousands to tens of thousands of bytes or just small relative to the... Um... From what he was talking about, they were like, they were just metadata stuff. So like text files, we're talking maybe a few K a pop. Okay, so a few K does not fit in something like optimizations commonly used for some links or something where you effectively put it in the uh, inode without indirection or something. Because metadata easily gets into the kilobytes. Yeah, I mean, I don't specifically know. I just know it, it, uh, his specific workload. I just know it was discussed briefly. Yeah. And if you can't change your application to split up the writing to different uh, file systems and then tie it together, I don't know, with some links on the fast volume that you have, like uh, all your small files on a pure flash pool, and then have the application write to the spinning disk pool and put a sim link in place once it's done. And that's just annoying to have to write your code to work like that. Yeah. Uh, instead, if you can just say, okay, blocks up to 32K or something are, are allowed to go onto the NVMe flash and the rest goes to SATA uh, SSDs or something. Exactly. That's So that you can get 
mid quality, like the things which can sustain 400 or so megabytes a second um, and not immediately die. SATA SSDs, uh, put those on a SAS backplane. Yeah, I know, here be dragons, either with interposers or just say, okay, I think the quirks have been sufficiently worked out for my application. And then you get a just a lot of ports. If you have a modern AMD server, what are you going to, to do with 128 lanes uh, of PCIe? Maybe you just add a bunch of HPAs and have a direct to disk uh, cable uh, tree. If you have a chassis where you can just put in a lot of two and a half inch SATA SSD, you can get fairly cheap storage hooked up. It's not going to be as fast as NVMe, uh, but it's also going to be, at least for now, cheaper. Well, and the question isn't, is it as fast as NVMe? It's is it fast enough for what you want to do? The question is, is how meaningful is that mid-level performance tier uh, of just basically good enough uh, cheap flash between really nice flash and spinning crap? And it comes to IOP. Does it make sense? Do you want a device with thousands or tens of thousands of IOPS instead of millions of IOPS as a mid-tier between the device with millions of IOPS and the device with hundreds of IOPS. Well, I'm going to wait until my 45 disk uh, server arrives. It's technically 90 disks, but it's divided mm -hmm. into two systems where 45 is connected to each. So let's see what happens there. Ideally, I would love to have like one of them active and the other one passive, and I just do ZFS send receive back and forth. What uh, kind of device are you buying exactly? Can you talk about that? Yes, it's. I think I might be mistaken. I think it's a four U, uh, super micro, for mm -hmm. specifically made for storage, and I can even find the links. Of course. Um... If you have the time to tinker, and it is a, because this sounds a lot like what Trunas did for their bigger systems, which mm -hmm. were also built uh, around um, super micro chassis. If you have a non transparent uh, PCIe bridge between the two nodes, uh, can have super micro provide you with one. You can have a, effectively a, a kind of like a GPU riser cable sitting uh, between the two JBots, oh, sorry, the two controllers for your two JBot halves. And then, yeah, FreeBSD, for example, can treat those as a kind of special purpose uh, network interface so that mm -hmm. you can just DMA Ethernet frames between the systems. Mm -hmm. And then you could use something like CTLD uh, to yeah, instead of the uh, using like. send and receive to keep your pools replicated, you mm -hmm. could have, uh, if it is a mirrored pool, you could just set it up with four way mirrors mm -hmm. and have a redundant half in each system. And normally you have one pool and Oh, so yeah, you're it's saying just degraded. you're saying you're saying my ninety my ninety discs could be a single pool, and, and one of them. If you set it up correctly, you could uh -huh. set it up in such a way that you could lose one half of a pool, and the pool is still uh, is degraded but usable, mm -hmm. and basically make the discs from one half accessible to the other one, and then import the whole pool. And you don't have to go through ZFS send and receive. It provides the operational um, advantages of having fast failover because mm. you don't have to move data. Yeah. 
has the so, answer that it's so, not two completely separate systems. Yeah, I was I was gonna ask. So so one of the boxes would do CTLD mm -hmm. and expose the device, the discs, sorry, and the other one mm -hmm. would see them. But would that be fast enough? There are different ways. Uh, in theory, we have uh, asymmetric um, LAN support. So you could have CTL in uh, active passive failover mode in CTL, but I never had the hardware to try that uh, in a real system. Oh, well, let's wait a couple of months and I'll give you access. We can play around <laughs> with this. <laughs> Just like the old server, yeah. That was the because, sad one because because the old server was like it came in shitty, you know, and then we had to yeah you had it. the wrong HPA so you didn't have real HPA you were yeah. settled with oh uh, we assume everyone is running Windows and there is no yeah. proper storage so you we have to do it underneath the operating system where because, uh, because 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 they they think that if, because they think if you're running. A Unix-like system, then your server has to run ESXi, so you can make a VM on top of it. And then I thought, I mean, I could do software, right? What? Why would you? And lately, I learned that ESXi can't do software uh, volume management. And the next problem is that if you have something like an LSI trimod card, yeah, it's basically treating everything as SaaS. So uh, all the NVMe devices you attach to them are accessible, but they're kind of limited through the firmware design to perform just a little bit better than solar touch SCSI SSDs do. As in Holy your shit. the server is 108 kilograms. Yeah, that's heavier sure. than me. So you have two options. You, you, I have two options for what? You mean moving it? No, to change it. Oh. Either accept the fact or start eating. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to. Uh... <laughs> yeah, but joking aside. Um, yeah, that's not something you should uh, attempt to wreck on your own uh Without a proper, of course, hoist. Of course, yeah. Uh, instead, get four people, maybe five, uh, or get a proper hoist. Yeah, but this is this is good. I mean, as soon as this arrives, this could be a very nice yeah, I mean, a, for for. My ZFS. biggest worry with such a system is that all your eggs in a single basket, trusting in. Yes. Fairy tale hardware, like yes. oh yeah, no ignore that you have a single PCB for the power failover between PSUs. Just assume that this point of failure is not real. <laughs> yes, I mean it's a very unlikely point of failure, but this is also a single point of failure. I mean you have no idea how many times I pinged the oxide for them to sell it to here. And mm -hmm. the response has always been, we are we still need to figure out like European regulation. I'm like, my country has no regulation, bro. <laughs> Just bring me the device here. <laughs> we'll buy it, no problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they did an interesting uh, Oxide and Friends episodes about their uh, storage layer. Because they do have their own little just freeway mirrored um, block storage layer, where one lower half of it is uh, ZFS, but it's basically free ZF, basically one Z pool per device, and then software on top of that, if I understood it correctly. Okay. Uh, yes, HLA, exactly. Server. Four people is a, Alexander. I totally agree that four people is the uh, YOLO approach you're not supposed to do. Yes, you're supposed to have a proper lift. Ah, like those. Oh my God. I had the. Yeah, see, the, the thing ah. is, when I used to work for European companies, we had, we had, yeah, I did call this actually a forklift. But now I, I work with like, you know, 
um, mm -hmm. developing countries, which means <laughs> you don't get this. Instead, you get five people. <laughs> yeah, and instead it's usually, of it's usually like the electric guy from downstairs, the janitor from mm -hmm. upstairs. You know? <laughs> and everyone so has an idea of how a server should go into Iraq. So. <laughs> yeah, so uh, instead of buying the proper forklift support, you just uh, break one back per server. I understand. Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and ev eventually you will break a server and a raised floor. Because that's another thing to watch out if you rack multiple such systems. What yeah. is the maximum load your uh, infrastructure can handle per mm -hmm. rack? But yeah. even power, it's just you can realistically crush the raised uh, floor tiles. And then you have a rack tipping over. I hate this. The mm -hmm. model is compatible with Microsoft Server 2019-2020 certified for Red Hat Enterprise Linux Oracle Linux. Like, this means nothing. It does, just not to you. <laughs> it means for people uh, that, yes, you can blame someone else when you have low-level issues. And the other part is, the less cynical one is, you can expect it to come up and be usable if you use that and yeah times the 64 that terabyte that's that might be an overkill maybe i'm not sure i don't know what you want to do with the system oh it's just going to be a nas there's no hypervisor or anything running on this maybe just some jails for sftp and uh File upload download, mm -hmm. but it's basically an S. It's not going to be doing high hypervisor things like my current so, uh, machine. You have to keep in mind you want to have a, a certain ratio of RAM to capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and the other part of that uh, RAM is a nice read cache. Yeah. Uh, it can also cache a bursty asynchronous writes. Yeah, I'm too confused. RAM is nice to have. The other question is, what which HPA are you going to get? That's and so, you do, which HPA, is, which network card are you going to put in it? Chelsea's. I'm very happy with Chelsea's. Yep. Solid trust. Yeah. Just... Do I need this? What the hell? What do they mean by an M2 controller? I don't know. It's... No, Maybe thank you. some kind of. Uh, Disk on module or something. Like yeah, that. no, thank you. M2 drives on controller. No, thank you. M2 drives on motherboard. Yes, I would like that. Let's do. Oh, uh, could it be that you can make them available to either side so that you can have something like the ability if the one mainboard fails of the real mainboards, you can pass through the yeah the controller and the main drive. To either HB, why is this HBA a thousand euros? Have a look at it. Mezzanine. And it's on a mezzanine oh. card, so it's probably a low volume production card. And yeah, they keep putting these weird things in here. And like, what's so weird about that? It's just a more compact form factor because. It looks if I'm, uh, go from just the picture on the top, looks like you're going to uh, put the main boards underneath the disk. So it's a five U box or something, right? It's, an, yes. it's a four U box. Okay, but everything has to fit under, or something at least has to fit under the drives, right? Yes. Or do they, you know, otherwise we wouldn't get. The Wait, number I don't of spindles. Know. I should, I'd rather ask. Take a rather... look. There's a manual for the chassis. Oh, there, if you look at the back, you have a view of the. No, no, not that one. This one. Yeah, here. So there is uh, a main board on each level. It's not all 
squished underneath. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have probably fairly short main boards. Um, well, I'm gonna go with 10 first, or rather mm -hmm. 10 times two, that makes it 20. Where is it? There we go. There's a point where you are beyond the optimal um, possible capacity. Oh, Melanox. They're also selling Melanox. 25 mm -hmm. gigs. Those do have proper FreeBSD drivers, but I don't have a 25 gig switch. I have 40 gig switch. Have a look I... as if you can... Not... What speeds were supporting some of the 25 gig parts can just take a 10 gig transceiver or deck cable? Actually, this 100 gig one seems interesting because I can actually buy a 100 gig per second switch for a thousand euros. If you don't need many ports, uh, Microtech has something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And you can yeah, break but... up the. Uh, I think they are using. Um, 25 uh, lanes in that part. Mm -hmm. So you can use breakout cables to turn each 100 gig port into four uh, yep. 25 gig ports. Yep. It's a neat little toy. There you go. I mean, it's it is 100 gig. But only four ports, but you can use it like, for example, to have one upstream port or even two, and then uh, several breakout ports. Yes. So you can almost think of it as a media converter with a switch. Jan, do I need a TPM? Jan, help me. Do I need a TPM? It's very um, important to know if I need a TPM. Microsoft told us that we need a TPM. Well, look at the cost of the full system. <laughs> look at the cost of the TPM. <laughs> and think again, if you uh, want to find yourself without one, and if you really don't want one, you can still whip it out. And you, at least you know that you have a compatible one. Well, not saying that I think you need slide. one, mm -hmm. just that... Uh, it's not worth to worry about given the cost of yeah. the system. How much is this now? 45,000 euros? Mm -hmm. Please, please show me in, in Freedom Units. 45,000 euros for USD. 48,000 euros. Yeah, that's still in my yeah, budget. Yeah, almost 50K. 50K, yeah, that's still, I mean, yeah, with the shipping and everything, it would easily be 50K. But yeah, um, the question is, is this really cheaper? Then, then getting two systems, uh -huh. because what are you limited by? What am I limited by? My limitation is I basically are you limited the... by rack space? Because this is the design you get when you're limited by rack no, space. no, no. What I'm limited in is that I can buy only a single thing, a single item. Like I can't say I'm buying two servers. Okay, uh, so you have to work around uh, organizational um, inefficiencies. Yes. yes. So uh, if, if I could buy two de de separate systems, I could buy something much cheaper, much better. But instead, I'm limited mm -hmm. with, I, it has to be a single system with a budget of 50K. So it's it's really, really terrible. I mean, the people who write Can these just... plans, they have no idea what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Can you declare? Can you guess who that is? That's the government. <laughs> yeah. Can you declare the two or three servers a cluster and then have them buy for a storage buy a storage cluster or something? I guess because... I could. Maybe I can try. I mean, I we haven't done a bypass like that around regulation, but I, it should work. May, or yeah, you buy try. a sto rack of storage and you buy. Buy a little half height rack, <laughs> even if you don't use it afterward. Uh, yeah. Just say that. Uh, Here's the thing, though. I would be wary of having this white elephant. 
Yeah, no, think of it this way, right? So this this machine has 45 disks, right, on each system. Let's say I'm using a single system, and if each disk is 20 terabytes, I'm getting mm -hmm. 900 terabytes. I don't have a single project that's 900 terabytes. So instead... And you're not going to get 900 terabytes. You're getting 900 terabytes yes. of raw... Exactly. Theoretical capacity. Exactly. And I mean... because of that, because you're limiting yourself through the form factor of one chassis, especially a 4U one, which is high, but in theory, they used to be bigger chassis, even if you are unlikely to see them on these days. So what happens is now you're forced to basically buy the biggest disk. Exactly. But maybe when you look at the trade-offs and you weren't restricted by anything but a purchasing price, then you would find that it's probably better to get more medium-sized disks just because you're getting more IOPS because a 22 terabyte disk that is not good or 20 it's not going to give you significantly more read or write bandwidth or uh, IOPS than just yeah. um, 10 terabyte disk. Exactly. But it's also not going to eat significantly more power. So yeah, that's the problem. What do you know? And maybe we should just discuss it some other time. Uh, off the record. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I'll definitely have a have a look and see what I can do there because uh, what happened is now we have like a national supercomputer center, right? And the current capacity of the supercomputer center is one point five petabytes, but that's the raw capacity that they have, which is not much for the work that we do on DNAs and other scientific things. So we're kind of going to be in a situation where we do our computation in the supercomputer and then we move the data to our own storage. It's a kind of a sad place, to be honest. And I mean, the people who built the supercomputer, oh my God, I hate the idea that, I mean, look at this. You're, you just need to look at this and see why I'm angry. I mean, it's, here's what each node is it's 64 gigs of ram on each node i have batch jobs how old is that system how old is this system this was gifted to us by the french i think it was built a decade ago yeah that's probably what they decommissioned because it's not worth the power and uh, floor yes. space to keep it yes i mean i have batch jobs which require say 500 gigs of ram so I can't yeah. use this supercomputer. It's kind of very stupid the way it's built, which is why we're using no, my system. Not if you look at it, have a look at the CPUs. This are, uh, I think, Haswell based parts. Has what? Intel E5 V4. Yes. So yeah, the E5 V4 so family cute. is, uh, let's have a look, if my memory is correct, I think, okay, they're brought well, but yeah, okay, same vintage. Yeah. Those are CPUs some around. Yeah. And I told them when they were going to buy this from the French, like this is not going to be enough. Like half of the scientific community in Armenia has this capacity in their like cabinet. And we know that this is not enough because we have some batch jobs that need to load like 500 gigs of data into memory to start processing. They're like, no, no, we need this. We just need a, a supercomputer center in the country. I'm like, no, no, you don't. You have no idea what the hell you're doing. And uh, this is what we ended up with, basically. And mm -hmm. uh, no one's using it. I mean, not no one's using it, but like uh, maybe 10% of the community is using it instead of that they were expecting like 80% of the people are going to use it. Like, no, 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 they won't. Yeah. And it's so old. I mean, it's like it's it's a, it's an old CentOS system and the management is done by Slurm and the Slurm is also not distributed properly. It's, it's a whole nightmare of things. And... Uh, Basically, it, I I couldn't 
I couldn't. Uh... If it was my infrastructure, I would be very grumpy. I mean, sorry, I would be grumpier, not, yeah. <laughs> I would be grumpier, yeah. Yeah, you're right. The macro architecture is about a decade old. Now it came out in late 2014 or so. Yeah, it's a decade old. As soon as it hit a decade, they Pretty good old. guess, yeah. 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 And but a supercomputer yeah. is more than just CPUs. It's, all, it's the Infinity Band Connect, this and so on. The other problem is you often if you have the old fashioned MPI workloads on it, you mm -hmm. kind of have to snapshot your state periodically to uh, resume uh, if something crashes or just if a node fails. There is no, this is not Erlang normally. Mm -hmm. So you can't yeah. just recover from a failed node. Instead, you have to resume from the last snapshot or start the whole batch job again. Yep. And if the runtime is high enough, you Which good luck. To be uh, fair, if your code is written properly and your scripts are written properly, a Slurm can do that very nicely. Yes, but you're losing a lot of time every oh, time yeah. you yeah, lose absolutely. a node. If you have a long enough running job, at some point you have just a problem that it gets exponentially less likely to ever run to completion if you have a really big supercomputer. So instead, you have to use yeah, some kind of snapshotting mechanism to just dump your state periodically to some kind of scratch pad, uh, scratch pad storage. Mm -hmm. And then basically we unfor your state from that if you recover. Six it's not... Okay. Hmm? So I was just looking at this. It's like 612 compute nodes, and I'm thinking... I yeah. already manage five hundred nodes. I could easily make a cluster at a cluster with my current machines. Obviously, my mm. machines don't have you know Intel you know E five V four each, but still, you know. Yeah, you probably have newer CPUs, right? But um, yeah, joking aside, um, can you guarantee the same uh, latencies as the uh, Infiniband fabric uh, holding that thing together? The what? If you look at it, uh, they claim they have uh, infinity band links between the compute yes. nodes and pro hopefully yes. the storage as well. Yes. And that can be really important, especially when you need uh, the fabric to do reductions. So yeah, with infinity band, you I, can do remote I... direct memory access. And if uh, I've never had gotten my hands on it, but from reading what vendors are claiming and just white papers and so on, these things can actually do uh, reductions like uh, minimum, maximum, sums, mm -hmm. and so on in the fabric. Yeah. Which, yeah, that's nice, but... Yeah, Greg, I remember this, and I, I was actually watching the auction mm -hmm. live. It started with someone like putting in uh, like three thousand dollars, and then yeah. it kept going like five thousand, ten thousand, <laughs> until until someone actually bought it for like half a mil, and it's very cheap. Yeah, it is very cheap, but it'd be extremely expensive to move, especially if it was going any distance at all. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, they uh, whoever bought it got a good deal. I hope it was a university or something, but. Um. Yeah, I yeah. wonder. So it's I mean, only seven years old too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I remember when they it's, built it. Uh, wasn't that one of the? Uh, if I remember correctly, that's one of the old-fashioned system, pure CPU, no accelerators. Yep. So it's by modern standards a real power hog. It's just going to eat lots of power uh, with little to show for it. Well, it depends on what kind of work you're doing. Exactly, yeah, there's work yeah. loads you can't really accelerate yeah. with GPUs or uh, some kind of, I don't know, NEC has these neat little vector accelerator cards for 64-bit floating point throughput instead of just uh, inference workloads. Yeah, they, they didn't disclose who uh, 
who purchased it. Yeah, I was curious who that would have been. I suspected well, that it that it might have went to some uh, like eBay place that's just parting it out or something. Yeah, that's the other option exactly. That someone just bought it for parts. My favorite uh, story is I think when the NSA used PlayStation threes or PlayStation. I don't think 4s. it was the NSA, but. And they use it like uh, for you know distributed. Things. There were a number of groups that did that. Yeah, um, Sony really hated that because uh, yeah. they subsidized each. They uh, subsidized the production costs of all of them. <laughs> yep, and it was really useful to compute MD5 rainbow tables uh, or PSK attacks against Wi Fi's and so on at the time because. While it was a nightmare to program for, if you had an embarrassingly parallel problem to throw at it, which could fit in like 200 or so K of local memory, like for example, computing MD5 rainbow tables, the cell was a monster for its time. This is a very interesting, wait a second. The cell was a very interesting processor. It PlayStation was a... three. PlayStation Three was able to boot Linux or FreeBSD directly. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. And later, Sony, uh, um, but the, it was a lost opportunity to just sue them into oblivion because they just forced a firmware update on users, which removed that without breaking it. Oh, uh, this was so... the George Hot story. Yeah, later, the thing is that. Oh. You that was one of the ways you could bypass the copy protection by yeah that was their that. that was their and claim. They, that I was always a claim. I always thought it was more along the lines that they absolutely hated it because they no, took a loss point, on everyone sold. Not at that point. When you look at when they did it, at that point they that did the die shrink and were no longer subsidizing the hardware. So the other OS wasn't removed early enough for it to be at a point in time when they were really subsidizing the hardware. After well, the they certainly shrink, weren't making as much on anybody using it that way. Yeah, but at that point, the chip wasn't interesting to use for other OS as a just compute node. Wait, technically speaking, can I buy a used PS3 right now? Downgrade the firmware and install um, on it. I think you have to jailbreak it, but um, or get one which was never updated and make sure to never put a game with in, uh, in it because some newer games, if I remember correctly, auto update the firmware with the one on the game. Yeah, I think you 30 bucks. Okay, I thought it was, I think it was that you had to make sure that it just never updated. Now, there are ways to completely break the... At least at the time. Yeah. Well, looks like I, I mean, at this, at this point, a lot of the <laughs> protections... Well, the other problem is that uh, FreeBSD, at least if I remember cor correctly, didn't make real use of the accelerators. So you were basically limited to the two uh, PowerPC cores. And the because the um, vector cores on the cell are just simple in order cores with just local S run as memory. Those run at 3.2 gigahertz, which was really high clock rate at the time. To have a power PC node, which uh, CPU, which could keep up with that clock rate, um, IBM created a truly cursed uh, power PC, which is like combined reverse of a Pentium 4 and an Atom. It has a very deep pipeline, but it's in order. So even things like verbal with uh, shift instructions are microcoded on that thing. Basically the, the power PC cores on the cell are really uh, there to manage the SPEs, the vector cores. Yeah, as your uh, as your Wikipedia page there says, there was certainly some people doing using yes. it for more legitimate purposes than just computing rainbow tables. Exactly, it had a few niche use cases, but the other problem is, it, if I remember correctly, they only had hundred megabit Ethernet. 
and you couldn't really attach uh, fast st storage either. So it was, um, and you don't have m lots of memory either. And with the XDR memory, it's yeah, there's a lot of memory bandwidth for what it is. Well, but I mean, XDR is always high latency memory, so yeah. By, the cache by modern, system isn't great. By modern definitions, sure, but no, you know, by the definition the, of DRAM of the time. Yeah, at if the you, time, none of it was that bad. It was. It's almost as bad relative to the rest of the system as the uh, RAM bus memory in an N64. That's Maybe not tree. as bad, but uh, it has bandwidth, but it has high latency. Uh, so to get good throughput out of a cell, you really have to design your program as a multi-stage pipeline designed around the DMA engines of small vectorized mass kernels. Yeah. If you can do that, the chip was blazing fast as for its time. I've been actually eyeing these servers, the Dells with like the front disks. They actually look very nice for like a home NAS solution with like a bit of low power and low noise. Has anyone ever played with any of these? Do you need for hot plugging ability for a home server? Not necessarily. It just looks nice. But yeah, it looks nice, but it's not going to be uh, nice to sit next to because uh, it's going to be clickety, clickety, click. I see what you mean. Uh, if you want a high discount, a uh, disk, uh, just look, home NAS server, I would look into a fractal design. Uh, R5 or something. This can take like a dozen disks. Uh, with Wait, proper vibrate. Yeah. Who, who's the manufacturer? Fractal Design has uh, cases with lots of internal disk drives on uh, vibration dampened caddies. It's internal, um, and they have basically they are one of the low noise. PC producers and some of their older cases, cases, the first one. And, and then if you look at like a define or something. Define. There we go. Yep. And then the big ones. Uh, like an define seven, or maybe even if you still sell them, the old define five or five or something. Five. Because uh, when the use for having lots and lots of uh, so just search for define five in that cell. Don't give the window one. <laughs> and there's different sizes, and you can put lots of disks in them by getting an extra and uh, lower half with more three and a half bit drive cages internally, so that you can have more than the normal amount, but yeah, the downside is that people don't want to have lots of spinning disks in their gaming systems anymore. And the Define series has good dampening. I also Which found is... this, and Sigma. Yeah, there we go, Latte Panda Sigma. Yeah, these ones. They, yeah, okay. These look pretty That's... interesting. Is that the one? Oh no, that isn't even the Intel one. That's a P core based one. Yeah. It yeah actually why not? Looks pretty interesting. And I I talked with them, and they told me that um, they do actually run Open Sense on it. Why well, wouldn't you? It's, there's nothing unusual on that thing. I was worried if like they had any kind of a weird neck or something, but apparently not. At uh, worst, some kind of killer neck bullshit, but probably just the no, cheap Intel the... default one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a two and a half gig drive. They have. And by the way, I checked there. The driver support for Illumos is is available for this as well. It's your run of the mill Intel desktop neck chip. Yeah, nothing unusual about that chip. It, it it actually looks very interesting because um, I mean, 
you may have problems with the Wi-Fi depending on what they pick. Oh, I could not care less about Wi-Fi. Honestly. But exactly, if you're running this as a storage server, you're not going to care. Because my, my issue is I have this machine. Uh... The other issues may be things like pen control, um, temperature monitoring, and so on. There we go. So in my home, I have this one, which is my laptop as my home server, which is what we are yeah. reading my blog right now, right? So it's it's an old laptop. It's not old. It's like from 2015. Uh, and it works fine, but I want to add Just more. Just a decade. Build. Huh? Almost a decade. Yeah, I know. Uh, and it, it works fine. The battery is dead, so I removed that. But other than that, it's working fine. But I'm thinking if I get a device like this, it would be much faster and a lot more CPU and a lot more uh, RAM. Mm. And uh... a lot more networking. Because like if, if, I, if I get one of those and I get the one that you said for storage... Now I can have uh, a better home infrastructure for my community. Um, so if you want to go completely crazy, yes, within the FreeBSD ecosystem, what you could do is you go on eBay or some place else. You get a sixteen gigabit multi-port uh, fiber channel HPA. Yeah. Put your son into um, your server into CTL export mode, and then you export instead of via iSCSI via Fiber Channel. Oh. Between your desktop and your um, other system, if you really want to go up quick. It's, if you get the right cards, that's possible with FreeBSD. Uh, this one would export the disks as CTL, and this one would... Uh, or z -volts. Or z -volts, yeah. And then you have a giant... Uh, Right cache in the form of the sans uh, main memory, as long as you are doing asynchronous writes. So yeah, four, five. But uh, the problem is, eight, what eight, are you eight, really eight. trying to uh, accomplish? Are you going to tickle your fancy, or are you going to solve a problem? <laughs> no, I actually need to solve a problem because the current server. Mm -hmm. Hosts, let's see, hosts a, where the God's name is that? Maybe we should just cut out of the, um, out the recording and then you can uh, cast to your heart's content. Might be, no, I'm not worried about the privacy. I'm just worried about sharing. Oh, there we go. Uh, there we go. Uh, nope. Mm-hmm. God damn it. Okay. It has these many things, which is like a blog, a blog, a git, a automation blog, database, mm -hmm. newsletter, blogging system for other people, uh, mini flux, uh, an actual forum that is a replica of uh, what's its name? Um, uh lobsters this is actually a lobsters software running here uh, <laughs> uh and the blog and the znc so this is all working fine if we have a look of course i don't have htop yes if we have a look here it's not like i'm using too much cpu oh, of course no but it's, yeah but it's let's have a look at the more that interesting part why is your git here so memory hanging is it just that there's lots of memory and it doesn't see a need to garbage collect or is there really so much going on? No, 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 because I I have a clone of Illumos Gate. And for some reason, Illumos Gate, processing Illumos Gate takes so much power by Gitia. It's the only repository that takes to so much. If, if you look into the logs, it's just processing the Git logs. I'm like, why are you processing? There you go. Can you pre-compute that? Is it something that just needs to be indexed once? I don't know, but this is the only repository because... that does that. Every because it's a mirror. It's it's the only repository that it does that. Oh, I have no or does it mm -hmm. yeah, maybe go on the support channels and ask uh, what a so to, be fair, about... to be fair, I'm running a version of Gitia that's like three years old. <clears throat> 
So it might be that. But yeah, my point is, uh, if I take this thing down, go down, go down, go down. God damn it. Mm -hmm. Go down. Give it's it time. taking its sweet time. Of course it it's is. Just a question, which database are you using for Git here? Yes, QL. Which one? Postgres. Okay. I mean, you can see the Postgres there on his yeah. screen. Oh, this is from inside the jail? Yeah, okay. So it... Mm -hmm. Did it reboot? Did you just restart the jail? Or... Just did a stop for J for the J. Oh, great! It died. Ah, oh, it's right next to me, you know. What happened there? Uh? Yeah, it died. Yeah, every time Git TI is the the bane of my existence at the moment. Uh, if it's just an old laptop, you can you still see something on the screen? Take a, get your phone, take an honest to God screenshot with a camera, not with a shotgun. <laughs> it got a page fault, now it's rebooting. What kind of page fault? I have no idea, but it did write into the crash dump. So I can check. So that. you actually panicked? Yeah, by, by stopping it in. Uh, probably, but what kind of networking did you set up? Is that alias based VNet? It is VNet, yes. Which FreeBSD version is that on the host? Latest. So current or fourteen one or stable or? No, 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 no. release. So fourteen dot one p six. Yes. It should not happen. Right, those issues were behind us in 14. Okay, I rebooted the machine. It it will come back up. But anyway, my point is, um, I would like I would like to to run more things for my community, like Lemmy and uh, other federated software. We already have a what's it called. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mastodon as well on the other servers. Mastodon, uh, yeah. Apparently, Armenia... Matrix and other resource hawks. Yes, apparently, uh, Armenia is in the top 10 of Fediverse hosters, like Mastodon and Write Freely and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, we're kind of proud of that. But anyway, until the machine reboots itself, which hopefully will be done properly, um, that's why I was thinking maybe I can get a, a nice machine with a lot more CPU and another one with. A lot more discs, and I can go crazy for my community. Honestly, the only thing that I'm using there is the, is the blog. <laughs> like other. So if you want to keep more. the power bill down and keep it quiet and so on, right? Split mean, storage and uh, capacity. The power bill here is cheaper than in the U.S. Okay, but why do you want to split the compute and the storage? Instead of just getting one reasonable system, because ah. you don't have to scale out, you can easily scale up in that range. That's a good point. I mean, I could, I guess I could get the machine that you were suggesting. Where is it? If you don't give um, much for to, uh, those things can take EATX mainboard. So you could get a, I don't know, a AMD ROM mainboard or something. Get mm. a cheap thirty-two or forty-eight core. Um, used Rise uh, Epic CPU for that. Mm. Yeah, it's cheap. DDR4 Adams and just go hawk if you want. You, you can get a fully uh, fully kitted out Epic board, including the processor, relatively cheaply. Yeah, the nice thing about Epic is that unlike um, Threadripper or the desktop parts, you don't really need a chipset for the server CPUs, oh. which gets the mainboard costs of the single socket server mainboards without anything too fancy down to below the high-end desktop boards because there just isn't anything but a CPU socket, a bunch of power rails, and um, a management chip on there that is active. If you 
look at the name board. There isn't anything big and expensive on there other than just the support for the CPU. You don't mm -hmm. have a chipset. You at most you have a NIC, but if you look at the main boards, there are some which don't even have that. If you go the route of putting it into a tower case, which unless you have a rack in a room where you can uh, ignore uh, noise uh, considerations. Oh no, I wish. Exactly. I assume that. Then you have to watch out because the server and storage and network cards assume uh, linear airflow in cubic feet per minute, uh, which you're not going to see in a noise optimized desktop case unless you put a fan directly in front of the um, PCI cards. Yeah. So uh, way, you get uh, an... now that GTI is dead, look at look at the idle. Like it's yeah, just completely idle. idle. That thing yep. is just uh, twiddling its thumbs, and um, yeah, unless you want to be be more vulgar in your uh, yeah. I, I, I will I will definitely fix the uh, post the sorry the the the, the Gitia thingy, and my RAM is also pretty mm -hmm. much fine. I mean, at post boot, it's basically like thirteen gigs free, and this is yeah exactly. It's not blogs. doing much. Yeah, which is one I need to drop well. off. I do need to drop off as well. Actually, it's like uh, two a.m. here, and I forgot that it's three a.m. here. <laughs> I will talk to you guys later. And That's have a good one. Uh, I'm gonna bail uh, as well, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, Greg. Yep. Take care, guys. Yeah, I'm here. So um, I'll I'll close down the recording and uh, yep. we'll continue later on. Um, okay. Well, uh, thank you everyone for staying this long with us and um, please do like and subscribe. We'll see you uh, tomorrow or next week or whenever you join.